Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Titus 1 5. And when we were in 2 Timothy, we looked also at 2 Timothy 2 2 along these lines, and it says, And the things that you have heard from me, that's Paul, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And based on verses like this, we asked you to pray. We asked you to pray that God would bring us faithful men who would be able to teach others also. And we asked that recently. Of course, we know that the Lord has been answering that prayer, <laughs> even in advance, um, because we have you know, brothers that are able to, are equal to the task and who are able to teach that God has brought in our path. And um, several of them here right now. So this week, it's, this is cool because God, if you've been an, an asking the Lord to answer that prayer, I can tell you confidently that this week it became very obvious that he's answering that prayer. Sometimes he has to hit us upside the head with something that is undoubtedly him doing it. Um, this week I was contacted by two pastors um, on either side of the globe. Um, one named Obi, like in Obi-Wan, and the other one, believe it or not, his name is Jim Kirk. So, yeah, who would have thought? Samuel, Obi, Nuagbo, is, uh, contacted us. I don't know how he, he, he must have found us through YouTube. And here's what he wrote. He said, Pastor Bennett, the Lord's best for you your family, and all the saints in your ministry. My name is Brother Samuel, a grace member in Lagos, Nigeria. And by the way, Lagos is... <clears throat> this is actually where <coughs> Obi lives. Um, I'm zooming in here on... <sighs> That's where he lives on Mokoya Street. Now, it's hard to see with the lights. I don't know if you want to dim those over there. But... So he likes to post his post. <coughs> oh, he's right. Yeah, he's walking distance, looks like. So that's where Obi lives. And he's, he writes, Please, sir, I have some Bible questions. <clears throat> I don't know if you can find time to give me the answers. Here we don't have a grace movement and that makes things difficult for me. Sir, should I send them in Christ's name? Well, what am I going to say? <laughs> no. no. I just don't have time, sorry. Yeah. I'm working on my truck. Listen, this is, <laughs> this is an open door, right? So, so I write to him, yes, please send. So he responds, dear sir, and by the way, by the way, it's uh, right now, uh, about 10 after 6 p.m. there right now. Uh, dear sir, here are some of the questions. Number one, can a true believer fall from grace? Now, this is a pastor asking these questions. Um, number two, how can I know that I'm really saved? Will God send people to hell that have never heard the gospel? Explain to me what is unpardonable sin. What is that? Uh, number five, how should someone that is saved deal with sin? Thank you, sir, for helping me from your brother, Samuel Obi Mwagbo. So how would you answer, Obi? Chuck, I heard you say answer one of the questions which was how can I know that I'm really saved you said first John 5 yeah 5 and 11 through 13 I think it is
First John five. This is the record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. Is this what you're talking about? He that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the son of God. Good. It's a great verse. So we can know by his, the things that God had written. Right? His love letters. Well, let's start with this first question. How would you answer this one? Can a true believer fall from grace? No. Well, where would you turn? Where would you show? Okay. No, I think the only way to fall from grace is to return the law. So you're you're referring to how it is that the. It, it was written this fact this fall this whole concept of falling from grace is found in the book of Galatians right so just go and look at the context right okay the whole book that's right see. the whole book all of Galatians yeah if you got time yeah yeah absolutely I think Ephesians 1 uh, Ephesians 1 13 in whom you trusted you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation, in whom after you yeah. believed you were sealed, there you go, with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Yeah, it's the down payment. It's uh, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Good. Anything else? This Galatians 5 is what I wanted to say. Do you want to get more specific? Uh, okay. Galatians 5 4 on the fall of grace. This is where Paul says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Okay, yep, that's where it's found, this concept. And the context is what? They. They came to know God by His grace, but they thought they were made perfect through the flesh. And how but how common is that? How common is it you think that believers, after they come to know Christ, they think, well, that just took care of my sins up to the point I believed. It's super common. I bet you 90% of people believe that. And from now on, I'm on my own. You know, He just... All that did was take care of my past sins up to the point I believed. And no doubt that's what it is that was being taught here to the Galatians, you know. Um, There's a verse that says our sins are forget till we pass present and future. Well, they see that's a good question. Where does it say our sins are are that future sins are forgiven? Where does it say that? Exactly what I was thinking. Um, starting with Hebrews 9 22, where it says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. <clears throat> and in that context of chapters 9 and 10, look how often it is that he says that Christ's blood was shed what? Once. Once for all. Um. So that's good. The time, if you just consider the timeline, all of our sins were future tense. When Christ shed His blood once for all, how many of our sins had we actually committed yet? None. Yeah. All of them were future. So good, good. I'm but, trying to. I'm also trying to find that um, that verse. We are the righteousness of. Um, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, righteousness of God in, in Christ Jesus. Where is that? Is that the one? Second Corinthians five twenty one. Is that one? Um, mm -hmm. one. First Corinthians one twenty. Um, Rome, uh, or Romans three twenty four. 
Uh, Romans 3, 24. Um, yeah, that's good. That's excellent. 25, 26. Um, oh, there it is. So, oh, go back to that one. Go back to Romans 3. Um, mm-hmm. Through the remission of sins that are past, his uh-huh. righteousness that he might be just, I'm on 26 now, and the justifier. Mm-hmm. Lost. Yeah. And the justifier of him which holds it. Well, see, this verse 25, it's interesting that we landed on this because a lot of people see this and they say, oh, you see there, um, the only sins that he remitted are the ones that were past. And how do you how do you deal with that? Look at the original word and see if what's the or what's the tense of that past word. Because a lot of times it reads, mm-hmm. right? It's like it's... I would I would put a cross reference next to this if you write cross references in your Bible of again Hebrews right um, <clears throat> let's see if I can find it here Hebrews chapter nine verse fifteen for this cause. He is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. So the sins that are past that he's he's referring to here in Romans 3.25 have to do with the sins that were committed in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So So he not only died for sins that hadn't been committed yet, he died for all the sins that were committed in the Old Testament. Right? Now, does that mean all that everybody was saved? No, because not everybody believed God in the Old Testament. What? First John four seventeen. Uh first John four seventeen. <clears throat> Okay. Is that what you're looking at? Right. As far as the fall of the great for our, for our salvation and being righteous. So if okay. he's righteous. So are we. So are we. Yeah, good. Did did we do Second Corinthians one twenty two? I don't think so. Sealed us, given us the earnest of his spirit in our hearts. Good. Yeah. So if we have that, if we're sealed, that's past, present, and future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my answer to Obi was no. <laughs> That's what <you> said. <coughs> oh. um, however, they can fall the, from the concept of grace. That's what was happening with the Galatians. They were missing the idea of grace. They had fallen from the idea of grace. Being what? That God's as if saying to us, I don't expect you to do anything. You can't, in fact, do anything to add to the finished work of Christ, which is what maybe what made you think of Galatians 2.20, because what does verse 21 say? If righteousness comes by the law, then Christ had no need to die. Right? Right, And, and I always think of it this way. If once we know Christ as our Savior, the Father sees us as as perfect in Christ, yep. how can we lose grace? Because <clears throat> He sees us as an already accomplished and finished work. He sees us as complete in Christ. Jesus. We don't. It is it is see ourselves. ourselves. The problem is it's not that God does. To us, it is ourselves that says, "Oh, mm-hmm. I've really blown it now, and God doesn't see me anymore as a Christian, and, and I, I or that you know, and so what, what the heck now?" I and what's know. and what's worse is instead of looking back to and glorying in the cross, 
which to gave be, us forgiveness. Which gave us forgiveness. We we go about, we scurry about to try to do things. Right. You know, like the Galatians were doing. They were uh, you know thinking that maybe maybe circumcision would right that ship. But so I went on and said, if it, it, if it is true that we had to do something good to be saved in the first place, then it would be true that we could do something bad to lose it. But we know from God's word that there's we can't do good. There's no none good, no not one, right? None righteous. No, not one. And, and so then it becomes a question of, okay, what is it that accomplishes our righteousness? Is it us or is it Christ? And so I think that's where you were going with that. Uh, number two question. Anybody have anything else to add to that? How can I know that I'm really saved? That's a good question, isn't it? Is he asking from a feeling point of view? You know, or is he asking from a that he wants, he wants something from scripture I don't know. that proclaims that. He probably wants scripture. Okay. So. To give to his. And, the, and Chuck's, Chuck's point of First John, was it First John 5? Is that where you quoted? Yeah. Uh, is that we can know. How, how often is it, Chuck, you've asked somebody, hey, are you going to heaven? And they say, well, I hope so. And that's probably when you immediately show them first John five, right? Hey, right. you know, you can it's more than just a hope so, you can know. Um and then you know, people a lot of people will say, well that you're just arrogant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes what, sir. What I get on that most of the time is is uh so we're saying, well I'm baptized. So uh -huh. naturally I'm going to given all my sins that I'm going to go to heaven even if living while I'm baptized. Right. That's what I get. That's very common, yeah. yeah. So, there's, the, Romans, the one. Yeah. Uh, there's therefore now no condemnation yeah. on the previous question. No, and how can I know that I'm really saved? Well, he says, goes through, right? Yeah. He says that he doesn't, in Romans 7, <clears throat> it's obviously before Romans 8, he breaks it down in the, the two natures. Right? He says yeah. he doesn't have the power to do good. Right. Ah, so that's really good uh, because the paradox is that you can actually one of the assurances of salvation is this um, struggle, this war that's going on with it between the flesh and the spirit. That's good. Uh, this morning for me, every day, one day after the other, it's just you're not going to go. Ephesians one thirteen. Yeah, we. Uh, I think we looked at that yeah. earlier. But that answers this question also too. Right. First Corinthians fifteen two also. Yeah, the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you're saved. Yeah. And then you, then you know for sure you don't actually have think so. Right. Amen, brother. Right. right. So how did you answer this? So I was uh, at the. Uh, I think it was Home Depot. And I was in the line with a uh, dear brother. Um, uh, by the name of Richard Trujillo, and uh, struck up a conversation with the cashier about, you know, hey, you're going to heaven. And I can't connect to your Wi Fi network. You can reconnect to Wi Fi from your Google Home app under Devices, then set up. Give her the number so she can do it. <laughs> yeah, I would think. That's funny. And she said, well, I hope so, you know, pretty typical answer. And, um, Richard said, well, I know I'm going. And she said, well, how do you know? And his answer, I'll never forget it. He says, because the Spirit bears witness with my spirit. Which I thought was a fantastic answer. The Holy Spirit, whereby we're sealed to the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's Romans 8, 16. How? But How? And I suppose if we had time, she might have asked that question. How does the Spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? I think when we when we sin, it lets us know, it convicts us. Okay, struggle. One way. The struggle between the flesh and the spirit. No. What else? 
this I think it's just by revelation of the Spirit that we have that knowledge that we are saved from that we now can. revelation. Okay, that's good. Anyone else? So we've identified that okay peace. how it is that yeah, ironically peace. that's what I think peace. no matter what happens the peace of God peace. Yeah. that's fantastic the peace of God yeah that would be a feeling you know um, and revelation I mean you're on to something there Chuck here's how I answered him I be, believe he does so by in addition to what you have mentioned, the struggle, paradoxical struggle between the flesh and the spirit, um, by giving us a love for his word and a love for the brothers, love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. Interestingly enough, I have to, I just read something this past week that said that the um, when Paul died, this has to do with the movie Apostle Paul, when the, uh, Paul died, there were only about 2,500 believers um, in that whole area, that whole Middle East area. But that Christianity grew um, because of the care that Christians had for, um, mm -hmm. for others. The Christianity and, grew because right. people perceived that, yeah. And that That's by good. the end of it, it gave a certain time that there were over a million and it was because of the care. And, mm -hmm. they were, and it was saying how um, in today's world they're, 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 we don't have that same kind of care mm -hmm. for um, just everybody and anybody that, you know. Well, I see it in y'all. That's why you guys come here on Sunday morning. You know, otherwise you could just download something off the internet. You come here because you have brothers and sisters in Christ that you, you you love, that he's given you a love for. And here's, what verses would you turn to now to show somebody this, other than 1 John 5, which is, that that's the, that is the, the fact that you can know, right? Mm -hmm. But where would you turn to show that God can give us assurance of our salvation by our love for his word and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? How about 1 John 3? There's a lot of good stuff in 1 John, isn't it? That still applies to today. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. <clears throat> so, And yes, Chuck, we're going to touch on 1 John chapter 1 here in a moment, which interestingly answers this as well. <clears throat> Also, Romans chapter 7, verse 22, I delight in the law of God, which is the, well, the word of God, right? After the inward man. Before I got saved, the Bible was a dead letter to me. And I said, well, this is, I'm not getting anywhere with this, and I need, I need something to give me a positive attitude, and the Bible wasn't, wasn't cutting it. Because I was, I was not saved. I'd read it and I'd think, well, this is about the most depressing thing I've ever picked up. So then I, picked, I said, well, I need to read some Norman Vincent Peale, right? Because he was the power. He wrote the power of positive thinking. Well, that didn't do anything for me either because he never said how. It was always, and I knew it. It was the, it was the cart before the horse. Uh, the, the message, the connotation was if you act positive, you'll become positive. And it wasn't working, okay? It wasn't. Um, joy, as you know, has to, is it, it comes from an overflow. It's not something you can make happen. Um, number three, question number three. Will God send people to hell that have never heard the gospel? Now, this one's a little more involved. Um, and bless his heart, I gave him both barrels. So I told him, I said, start by courageously showing people that the God of angel armies is a just God who will not be mocked. Right? Amen. And follow by proving from Scripture that His justice not only allows Him, but required Him to pronounce judgment on all men for all have sinned. 
<laughs> right. Romans, yeah, still both Romans 3.23 and 6.23. And proof from Scripture that he really, God is within his rights to send everyone to hell. And now, before you take another breath and share anything else with somebody, just keep in mind that they're going to forget what you just said. <clears throat> Why? Why is it that people are so quick to forget that God is within his rights to send everyone to hell? Because of pride? It, because it's it, pride. Thank you. It's pride. That's it. What's it? How's that pride? You know, they'll try to dress it up any way they can. They say, yes, but if God is a loving God, he wouldn't do that. Right? They're judging God according to what they think instead of they, what God said. They're understanding God according to their idea of mm -hmm. their idea of what love is. Mm -hmm. you know? And this, uh, this is interesting reading this. That they're talking about, there are two passages in Romans to explain um, the one in Romans one twenty that says that his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, understood from what has been made so that men have no excuse. Yes. Um, but then Romans 2.15 says the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, mm. which says that taken together, these passages claim that everyone has an inherent knowledge of God, that this can be clearly known from creation, and that God, that everyone also has a God-given moral compass. We I saw agree. from... And I, and I agree with that. That's the same verses I was thinking of, mm -hmm. too. But I disagree with the, well, if God was loving God, he wouldn't condemn people. But mm -hmm. God, because he's loving God, condemns people. That's the part that, <clears throat> to me, I, I see it as uh, just being just is being loving and kind. It's like setting boundaries. He, mm -hmm. if, if a parent doesn't care about their ch children, they won't have any boundaries. They won't set any because right. they don't really care what they do, whether they come or they, right. they go or whatever, right? So that's incorrect. That's a great point. So what I hear you saying is, is that uh, most people's concept of a loving God is skewed because they think it should be, what's the analogy you used about your grandpa, you know? It's like grandpa's love, right. where he's willing to sweep an, a, a mistake under the rug and overlook it. Well, uh, and I've, I've told you guys this story in the past that that you know, we had a, a general manager that had one of his uh, desk managers. He caught him stealing money from the business, and he and he overlooked it and told the guy on the side. He says, "I, I won't." file charges against you as long as you pay it back. Well, it, to some people, that that might have been okay. But to the owner, it wasn't okay. Why? Because if you let him get away with it once, he's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. So so the, the general manager can no longer be trusted because he allowed one of his people who reported to him to get away with sin. See? So it is with God. If God swept anything under the rug or was or overlooked even one sin, how could we trust him? Why shouldn't we expect him to leave our sins under too? Right. And if if all it took was just sweeping them under the rug or overlooking them, why did he send Christ to suffer so? Right. So um, so, I said, follow by proving from Scripture that His justice allows Him to send everyone to hell for all have rebelled against Him. All have rebelled against Him. We all have. <clears throat> We're all born in unbelief, like it says in Romans 5.12. There's none that understand it. There's none that seek after God. And because of this, John chapter 3, verse 18 says, we are condemned already. It's not a matter of Oh, we're not really condemned until, unless we die having never believed. No, the scripture says we're condemned already. And it's because this isn't preached that there's no fear of God. No one can say they have an excuse. 
Romans 1.20, somebody mentioned. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is a tricky question because the people who mm-hmm. ask it are sometimes wanting to bind um, the person answering because it's not so much that they have a question about God's fairness and God's justness, justice as it is that they're questioning the Christian who mm-hmm. then proclaims, you know, or, or gives the answer. And it's, it's can be really right. tricky because... Um, I don't think Obi is asking it for no, that reason, he, though. No, he may be asking it on mm-hmm. behalf of someone. Yeah, absolutely, him, yeah. And he's got to be very careful how he answers it. You know, we're all we're all in enemy territory, but over I don't know what you guys, but you know, Nigeria filled with Muslims. So uh, we need to be praying for him. And then there's Romans ten eighteen, where the question is asked: Haven't they heard? You know, the question that Obi's asking is: Will God send people to hell who have never heard the gospel? Romans 10.18 asks the question, have they not heard? What's the answer? Yes, Yes, their sound went into all the earth and their words are the ends of the world. And we know from 2 Timothy 2.19 that the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. He knows all things, like it says in in Psalm 147.5. And He knows... Who is going to believe, doesn't he? So he also said, my spirit will not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Genesis 6, 3. And if you compare that, I would encourage you to write these scriptures down because we don't have time to look at all of them today, where there's many instances where Christ chose not to go to the left because he knew that nobody there would believe. So, uh, that's Matthew 13. well, there's Matthew thirteen fifty eight, Luke chapter four, verses six. Let's read Luke 14, Luke chapter four, verses 16 through 30. <clears throat> Let's read that. <clears throat> A lot of people read this. They can't believe it's in the Bible. Luke chapter four, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, this is Jesus. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for a read. And there was delivered him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he what? Close the book. Close the book. <clears throat> and the eyes, and he and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. There's, I would encourage you guys to look at the passage that he's quoting from in Isaiah and mark exactly when it is that he closed the book. It was literally in the middle of a sentence. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the rest of the sentence? No. About wrath comes next. Yes, the wrath of God. So, and and then in very symbolic gesture, he does what? He sits down. Which you know, those things are. It's uh, it's poetic how it is that. He he couldn't yell it any louder that he did not come in his first advent to pour out his wrath. We now know that, right? So anyway, he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, yet... You surely will say say to me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. 
And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent. You see that? God did not send Elias to them to save them, as it were. Save unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elisius, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Why? Because their idea of God is that he, God should have sent Elijah to them. If he's a merciful God, you see that? And rose up and thrust him out of the city. I love this. And led him to the brow of the hill whereon he was, their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. So they probably, you know, wanted to tie his hands and then pitch him over head first so he'd for sure break his neck. But he, what, what'd he do? He just said, he just went. Yeah. Like they couldn't lay hold of him. That's the power of God there. It's awesome. Is there, is there any significance, just curiosity, um, when he's talking about this famine and a lot of, a lot of widows, etc., that it was three and a half years? And then we think of. I don't know. Um, of course, there's Acts 22 18, where God says to, to Paul. He tells him not to go to a certain place because why? They won't receive my testimony. So the point is, would the Lord continue to send his ambassadors to those who will never believe? I don't think so. Now we don't know who's going to believe, which is why we have to, the offer has to legitimately go to everyone, right? Because we don't know who's going to believe. All we can do is pray that God would, you know, steer our feet in the direction of those who will believe, right? Is it any wonder why it is that the armor, the part of the armor that has to do with the gospel is what? Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So it's only by the mercy of God that anyone is saved. Why? Because God is within his rights to send everybody to the lake of fire. Romans 9.18 says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardens. That's God. He's in charge. <clears throat> Number four. Sir, explain to me this. What is an unpardonable sin? And my short answer was, if you look at the context of where that's mentioned in Matthew 12, 31, Mark 3, 29, Luke 12, 10, you'll see that in that what's happening. Well, there was a miracle that was performed, a sign, which signs that were for who? Israel, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. <clears throat> today, what are, what's our instructions today? We walk by faith and not by sight. Right. Signs were so they could see. And how did it help them? Did it build Israel's faith? No. They still rejected him. So that's why he says um, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Um, but they they were attributing those those indisputable miracles that Christ was performing for, for so to prove who he said he was. They attributed those miracles to Satan. That's what the unpardonable sin is. Okay, and check you can check this out for yourself. Since Christ Himself predicted that these signs would cease, Matthew twelve thirty nine, Matthew sixteen four, Luke eleven twenty nine, and so on, then the unpardonable sin is an impossible sin to commit today. It's impossible. Why? I mean, certainly we could. We can see a miracle and attribute it to Satan today. But does that mean you've committed the unpardonable sin? No. Because God is no longer in the business of proving that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He gave enough proof. 
if by no other reason, Paul himself says in Romans chapter 1, the resurrection, the greatest sign of all time. That's what it is that declared him to be the son of righteousness, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, my mother told me, just a side note, my mother told me, don't ever commit the untimely sin. I said, what is that? She says, suicide. Oh, suicide. You're right. Yeah. Well, I think she was trying to protect me. From there, is no, un, there is no unpardonable sin today. A lot of people think, just like she said, and I said, murder. You know, people who murder <coughs> never be forgiven because they're directed by the people. Yeah, except that look at that thief on. Look at that. Yeah, the thief on the Yeah. If if uh, murderers couldn't be saved, what do you do with King David? What do you do with Saul of Tarsus? Yeah, yeah. You know the chief of sinners. Yes, sir. Um, and the, the other thing to remember too is, the, if you look at it almost in reverse order, is to say there's no pardonable sin. So then, therefore, the assumption is. That there would have to be a sin more powerful than Christ's yes. sacrifice. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. If you look at it, flip it over backwards, yeah. and there's not. Mm-hmm. Nothing's more powerful than that. That's right. Yeah, that's cool. There are some that believe that uh, that Paul himself, because of what he said in First Timothy, that he was a blasphemer, that he himself was guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so can I ask? The, it, it, we could get into a we could get into a, a Bible study about the word actually that's translated forgiveness in Matthew is a different word than the word the Holy Spirit gave Paul that we ha, that we see as forgiveness. It's the same word in the English, but it's a completely different word in the Greek. But we don't have time. It's the the whole concept of forgi- forgiveness, or in this instance unforgivable changed at the cross. What was unforgivable prior to the cross is now forgivable. And check you can check me out on that. I think many yeah. people feel that in the end God is going to just say, okay, you can you can get into heaven because I love you. Hmm. But the truth is when it comes that you're being judged and you have not accepted Christ mm-hmm. at this point. At that point, at the end, there is no forgiveness for you. You have made your decision. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews nine twenty seven. Yep. Good. So how how do we how do we um, explain ten twenty six? Of Hebrews ten twenty six. Well, he's, it, if you look at, right, if you look at the context, he's referring time and again, and I, when I say context, I'm talking about going all the way back into even chapter 9 of Hebrews. Time and again, he says over and over and over again that, uh, like Hebrews chapter 10, uh, right there in the first part of it, he says, the law... Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there too perfect. <clears throat> For then would they not have ceased to be offered. <clears throat> because the worshipers once purged would have had no, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes, that is Christ, into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. A human. (coughs) In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will. O God, above when he had said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will, that is this second testament, the will of the second testament, 
we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And by the way, even though when this book of Hebrews was still being written, the priests were still standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. How cool is that? We talked about that symbolism. Stephen, right before he gave up the spirit when they were stoning him, looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. Meaning what? Judgment was imminent. That's what it means. But when God sits down, he's sitting on what? The mercy seat. Not in judgment. Continuing the thought here, he sat down after offering one sacrifice. There's, there's like we said earlier, in Galatians 2.21, it says, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. There would have been no need for him to die. The way to flip that over is, is that because he died, he met all the righteous requirements of the law. And he only died once. There's nothing else we can do to add to that. We can't get circumcised to add to it. Baptism doesn't add to it. Giving to the church doesn't add to it. Spending time in his word doesn't add to it. Nothing adds to it. So, that's why you should, you know, getting into God's word shouldn't be a duty. It should be something you do because you're hungry, right? Desire. Huh? Desire. Exactly, after the inward man. So then he goes on and he says, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering, you see the repetition here? One offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Are you perfect? No. Christ. Christ. Yeah. What does it say? So <laughs> you are complete in him. Okay, now with that with that in mind in the context here, he says, verse 17, he says, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And he says, now where remission of these is, that is these sins that were forgiven, which is how many of them? Amen. All of yours were future when he died once, right? Yeah. There is no more offering for sin. There's nothing that can add to it. And that's where this verse and this verse 26 tie into each other. There's no more exactly. sacrifices we can do. Exactly. And if we sin willfully, which we do in our, in our flesh. Every day. Every day. We make choices. There's nothing we can do. There's no sacrifices, right. no animal sacrifices, no whatever you say right. we can do. Because it's been done. Right. Right, but we're not we're not without hope. Pardon? We're not without hope, you know. I think that's what people lose sight of them thinking that there's supposed to be some magic transformation, a magical yeah. transformation, right? Yeah. Right. And it doesn't come. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't happen immediately. I'm speaking from experience. But it doesn't mean I'm not saved. Right. I still the one thing I do have is peace. Amen. You know? And, and hope. Yeah, and hope, and hope absolutely. Yeah. But you are saved immediately, though. Yeah, I agree. So, you're not glowing. But you you also have knowledge. You also have knowledge. You know, what you can tie into the piece. You know that when you transgress, you know that you are forgiven. Right. You know that. And that's the piece, right? That's the piece. Well, that's what that's like. It's spiritually Satan's attacking you that way, telling you that you're screwed up, you're not worth it. You're not being saved. You're not saved because you keep screwing up, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a daily battle, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we go through that every day. You know that if we're honest, in and attacks that say, you. Yeah. How can you do that? When you're you saved. You're right. Right. How can you, you call yourself a Christian yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Right? right. That's a tough one. It is. It is. All right, we've got about that's ten minutes here. We got to <laughs> roll. Because we haven't even gotten to the second pastor yet. <laughs> so, um, question number five. How should someone that is saved deal with sin? Which is a great <coughs> segue, right? Because the answer to the previous question is almost is, you'll pardon me for saying this, Darlene, is that it's reckless. 
that people that people people perceive the the first time that people's ears are are open to the grace of God, they perceive it to be well. Then we can just live any way we want. That's reckless, right? So hence Obi's next question. Okay, now what do we do when we know we've got failure? We know we've got sin nature. Don't ask me how how it is that I know. So, this may come as a shocker, but 1 John 1 9 does not apply to the body of Christ. 1 John 1 9 says, you know, if we confess our sins, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity. But, But what you pointed out earlier, Chuck, is that the verse before and the verse after say what? Let's take a look. Back when we were talking about how can you know you're saved? Uh, 1 John 1 8 says what? 1 John 1 9, here's, here's where we see the a very commonly used verse that says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? And we don't have time to get into a verse by verse on chapter 1 here, but I would encourage you to compare it to Galatians 2. Ask yourself, who is it that John's commission was to go to and and who did he preach to? So when he uses the word we here in 1 John chapter 1, who is we? Jesus. You said it. And if... And, and if you compare this to what the Jews had been saying th- throughout the whole Old Testament, they were saying, well, we're not sinners. Same way that Saul of Tarsus said in, in, in the book of Philippians, he says, according to the law, I was blameless. If you were to come to me and tell me that Christ died for my sins, I would have said, what sins? Check it out, Philippians. So the Jews were the Jews had gotten into the habit of of not believing that they were sinners because they said, "Well, as long as I'm going and making my sacrifices on a regular basis, I'm covered. I don't have sin." But he but he says to his to the Jews he's preaching to here, and it applies to people here today, right? That if they they I've actually met a guy. In college, that said this, that said, "I don't have sin. I don't have a sin nature." But what does God's word say? If it says, "If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us." Alternatively, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I wonder what the tense is on that. Hmm. Uh, look at that. It's past tense, second nearest. He has forgiven. So, <clears throat> verse 10. Now let's look at verse 10. He repeats it. He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So nobody's saying, you know, to, to lie. If anything, a believer knows he has a sin nature. Believers of all people know that. So the question to ask yourself is, is John talking to believers here? Is it possible that he's trying to evangelize his Jewish brethren? Hence the word we. Okay. Uh, it's, 1 John 1, nine is the most misapplied verse in the Bible, in my opinion. We cannot, in our own power, deal with sin. If we could, then Christ would have had no need to die. If we're to confess anything, we should confess the way Paul did in Romans 7, 18. What did he say? I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwell a no good thing. You want to know why it is I have that verse memorized? <laughs> for, for the, he says, for the will is present with me. That's the new man. That's the new nature. That's the new creation. It has the desire. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. <clears throat> I thank God for this verse. Amen. We should thank God for His design. God has a design in it. 
God has a design in putting us in situations where we don't know how to do it. How else are we going to learn? I remember when I was learning how to fly, that my instructor took us up, took me up, and uh, and he said, uh, "Okay, I want you to put this blindfold on." <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it was actually a hood, but it served as a blindfold. Okay, and he says, "Now he says, I want you to stall the aircraft and recover." Oh, oh, my God. Blindfolded, so I couldn't see how to write the aircraft by looking at the horizon. And so we we could start going up, 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 up until the plane stalls, and it went like this upside down. <laughs> I let go of the yoke because I could feel the plane going like this. I let go of the yoke and I grabbed onto my instructor and I said, Do something! <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> but you're here, so you obviously did. <laughs> That's good. Praise God. <laughs> so God has a design in putting us in situations where we don't know the answer. He has a design in it. And it's not pleasant. And sometimes there's pain involved because we're, especially nowadays where we're programmed to just go on Google and get the answer, right? But we, over, over time, and I've heard, heard somebody speak on this, that we lose the, the appreciation for the question. So... I mean, we should thank God for his design and putting us in a situation where we have to grab, as it were, grab him and say, I don't know what to do. We should thank God when we find ourselves in situations like that where he's leaving. And he had a design in leaving us with the sin nature to the point where we realize we can't even do the good things we want to do. We can't. In fact, he's using that to teach us humility. Humility. If nothing else. How about patience? Could he be teaching us patience? Could he be teaching us John 15, 5? Without me, you can do nothing. Anyway. I, I actually am, I'm actually kind of glad that you brought up that verse about Paul. Because um, truthfully, I'm going to confess something to you. I've always had a problem um, <laughs> justifying. Um, I, I heard you say that you cannot apply um, if you confess with your mouth. That it cannot be applied to Christians in the church today. That it applies to um, it, it applies to the Jews because the letter is written to the Jews. And I've always my contention is that confession is different than, than and I've heard pastors up on the up on the preach say, you know, forgive us our sins, forgive us our sins, like a litany, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, confession has always been to admit that you've done something wrong. Lord, I mm -hmm. I admit that I blew it today and that I did this and this and and mm -hmm. and while I don't ask for forgiveness, I say thank you that you have given me forgiveness for this mm -hmm. and that you will help me to do that, which is right. But so my contention has always been that I have not always agreed with you on this on this verse, and I really admit that um, mm -hmm. because I've translated it a different way than how you have translated it. But having this verse, you're talking about First John one nine. I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, you know, Yeah, well, either on either end of it, though, we talked about how it's he's referring to unbelievers in the context, but not believers. I, right, but that's where I have to disagree with you because I, I still believe. Well, that's fine. I, You're disagreeing yes, with the context. Yes, yes. but, 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 but so, what I appreciate is that you brought in this verse about Paul, and I know this verse about Paul, and, and you said oh. today, if you confess the way Paul has confessed, which yeah. is actually what I what he's saying is that Lord, this thing in me I have done and I keep on doing and 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 Lord, I know that I can't I can't do it without you. Um, right. You know, I can't I can't be right without you. Mm -hmm. Is actually um, a better explanation. I actually prefer the way Bob George presents First John one nine. He doesn't get into any dispensational stuff. He just says, look, it applies to unbelievers. 
And Bob George is spot on. I agree with him. A believer should not ask God to forgive him. Right. I, he already I, has. I, 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 but First John 1 John 1.9 says that. And hence the reason why it is Bob George says it's not addressing believers. It's talking to an unbeliever who, what? When an unbeliever admits that he's a sinner and trusts Christ, what happens? He's forgiven. So let's move on here. Uh, Galatians 5.17, it says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. And hence the reason that God left us with a sin nature is to put us in situations where we can't do it. We have to trust God. And thank God that he's showing us that it's only by the new mind of Christ within that we can serve the law of God. And it's only the flesh that serves the law of sin. Romans 7, 17, 20, and 25. It's the only reason that he can say there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So grace is so much deeper than many think, right? It's so so much deeper than anybody thinks. It's why it is it's going to take the ages to come for him to show us that grace. Ephesians 2, 7. And there's a, it's a lot, but the point is, it's a lot easier to serve God out of our appreciation than obligation. Or like Curtis Bradley says, out of love rather than fear. Now, most churches you go to, they, they put in front of people that the fear that they won't be forgiven if they don't confess. And that is out of the pit of hell. I'm sorry if I offend anybody by saying that. Not you, not you, but anybody who's listening. That that is not how God operates today. He operates in grace. He wants us to serve him out of love, not out of fear that we're, that he's, that our relationship with him is going to be broken. The reason for Romans chapter seven is to, is to, especially verses 17, 20, and 25 is to bring us into Romans chapter eight and understand why there is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because it's not you who sins. Look at it. 17, 20, and 25. Of chapter 7. All say the same thing. I praise God for the, for the revelation that it is that with the flesh I serve the law of sin, but with the new mind I serve Christ. I thank God for that. Why? Because I'm sweeping it under the rug or because I'm not admitting and owning up to it? No! I'm glorying in it. I'm thankful for it. Yes, thankful. For, a sin, for having a sin nature. Why? Because it keeps me humble. Teaches me patience. Helps me to understand that that's not who I am. That's not my identity. So why should I confess? It should give us more patience for the people around us as well. Why should I confess in, in this manner? Let me clarify. Why should I go to God and say, I'm sorry that I blew it? No. Romans chapter 7, verses 17, 20, and 25, Paul says it three times by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it is not me who did it. It's the flesh. Now, to a lot of people, that might sound like sweeping it under the rug or, or uh, giving them an excuse to sin. God forbid. Paul is not doing that. What he's doing is he's establishing a basis for us to have liberty, to be free from it. If you don't separate yourself from that part of you that sins, then you're then how are you ever going to be free? If you don't understand that that's not who you are, how are you ever going to be free from it? The hence he says to the Galatians, stand fast in the liberty that you have in Christ. Yes, there's going to be failure in your life. But a righteous man does what? He falls seven times and gets up because he knows what? He's righteous, not because he, you know, he thinks that God wants him to rub his face in his sins. It sounds, listen, it sounds real humble. It sounds humble for a person to say, I, 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 I did this, 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 and this, this, to enumerate all the ways that they failed. Bill Bright even used to teach that. He says, you need to write down all the ways that you failed every day at the end of the day and confess and ask God and apply 1 John 1, 9. That's out of the pit of hell. Because why? You're not setting your affection on things above. You're setting your affection on yourself. How are you ever going to live up to the 
to how it is that he is perfected by one offering, perfected them that are sanctified. He's perfected you. You're complete in him. He, you are holy. You are righteous. You are unblameable. You are unreprovable. Not because you made a sacrifice, but because he did. Some people will differ with me on that, but, I, uh, but his response was, thank you so much for answering these questions. And we don't have time to get into the second pastor, but I wanted you to see his response. Um, things that have been so difficult for me since I came across them. Um, he says, we don't have any grace ministries there and all my efforts to plant a grace church since 2008 have been futile. I need books to enhance my studies. Well, you, guess what? We're going to send them some books. Amen. And uh, he says, do you know of any pastors or Bible teachers that are in church planting that can help plant a church there? And he says, I beg you. He says, I beg for your consideration in any of this, my demands. He's, his English is not the same. He's not, he's not making demands. He means requests. Once again, I thank you for the answered questions. You're supposed to be a Bible teacher. Well, bless your heart. The Lord's best for you. Second Corinthians 13, 14, in Christ's name. So he, uh, since then, has infected. It came in about midnight last night, which was 7 a.m. his time. Uh, he sent me a list of some books that he'd like, and we're going to get them to him, God willing. So that'd be nice, I think, for us as a church to support him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in, in other ways, other than just sending books, maybe you could you could ask him. You know, our church would like to support you because we don't, we, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. We don't have any overseas, um, you know, like how they support missionaries and things like that. Right. This would be something that would be that we could do specifically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how else can we support him, maybe financially or maybe mm -hmm. in some other way? I mean, Amen. Yeah, I like it. It's something substance in our work. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. So he uh, gave me a list of books, and uh, and uh, if you want to support that, you know, there's an offering basket somewhere over here. And um, he already has things that differ, but we're going to, he had requested some other books that we'll get to him. He does have things that differ, right? That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I was you. thinking of uh, 2 Corinthians 5, like I think it's 16-ish or something. We were talking about flesh, and we don't, and I like where Paul says we don't even know, regard Christ after the flesh any longer. Isn't that like 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, I think? So, yeah, yeah, very good. From now on, we know no man after the flesh. Yeah, though we know Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth no him no more. And we so no man that this verse blows my mind because it shows how really our paradigm needs to shift because we have, we are so inclined to look at people's mistakes. But God, God who is in Christ, says right here in in verse nineteen that he's not imputing their trespasses unto them. So why are we? Why are we keeping score with people? And here's if God the, himself isn't. And, and if you keep languishing, but this is a, this very subject is not very passionate at all. But, um, the other thing too, I, I think it says it, the underlying question in Hebrews 10, or the statement there in the beginning of 10, 1, I mean, what's it from verse 10 down to verse 12 ish, where he's talking about the sacrifices of bulls and goats who didn't, like God didn't desire in there. Mm -hmm. but before that, he says that those daily sacrifices didn't make those who perform them pure as it pertains to their conscience or, or something like that. You know? right. right. So why not? If if uh, if God set those commandments as provisions for reconciliation at that time. Why didn't it make their conscience clear? Is God insufficient or something? Did he not complete the plan? I think the point there when he says conscience is that the whole point is if you're offering sacrifices all the time for your sins, that's all you're thinking about. So if you're your sins. Like, yeah. Because there's a remembrance. Exactly. And if you're right, I can't even imagine. I would never dare to sit down every day and write down what I've done that day. You can, no. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> And my point is, I don't want to because I don't want to revisit them because I'm going to feel worse about them and I'm going to be stuck in that 
I'm a sinner, I'm a turd, I'm this, and I'm just be stuck in this. See, so yeah, that's nice compared to how I say it to myself, okay? I'm being serious. And the point I'm making is, is that God doesn't want us stuck thinking about our sin all the time, or even looking at ourselves that way. He said it. I will remember their sins and iniquities right. no more. So if he's not remembering them, why should we remember yeah, them? Should we do what Paul, Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3 where he says, I, I forget what's behind. Exactly. And, I'm, and he's moving forward. Paraphrasing, of course. The opposite of remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I was thinking about in all of that. You uh, close us in prayer, bro. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you for sending Obi our way. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I'm going to ask that you would be with us and remind us every single day of your, of your mercy. Um, grow us in the knowledge and wisdom and understanding of you and who you are and everyone around us. <laughs> 